everyone, and welcome to the first video lecture of General Physics. Now, to start physics, we're actually going to do a review of some stuff that you guys learned in chemistry, the first of which being dimensional analysis. So we're going to write out the metric prefixes and their equivalent powers of 10, although we are not going to write out all of them that you learned in chemistry. We are only going to write out the ones that we are most likely to use here in physics class. So we're going to start then on the large side with giga. Giga um, is denoted by a capital G as a prefix. Whatever number we have, we're going to take that number and multiply it by 10 to the power of 9, which is 1 with 9 zeros behind it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 zeros. Then if we go down a little bit smaller, next we have mega which is a prefix of a capital M, and here we are going to take whatever number we have, multiply it by 10 to the 6. So 1 with 6 zeros behind it. Um, hopefully you guys are very familiar with kilo, with the prefix of a lowercase k, where we multiply numbers by 10 to the third, which is the same as um, taking that number and multiplying it by 1,000 to see how big that number really would be. And then we have your base. There is no prefix for the base. The base, you're multiplying by 10 to the power of 0. And if you remember from math class, anything that's raised to the power of 0 just turns into 1. So we are not multiplying by anything when we're talking about a base. Whatever the number is, it's just that number. Now, no, when we do prefixes that are now going to be smaller than 1, the first one that we will run into frequently is centi, uh, denoted by the prefix of lowercase c, so maybe like a centimeter. And here we are multiplying by 10 to the negative 2. Now, that negative 2 means that we're multiplying by a number that is smaller than 1. And in fact, it is two decimal places smaller than one, so we're multiplying by 0 0.01. And there is milli, represented by the prefix of lowercase m. This one, we are multiplying by 10 to the negative third, so there are three decimal places less than one. Uh, one that you guys might have used in chemistry is micro. Micro is a little bit funky. We use a Greek letter as our prefix. That is a Greek letter mu. It's kind of like a U with a tail in front of it. And here we are multiplying by 10 to the negative 6. So 0 0.000001. And then finally, we won't use this one hardly at all, but it's always good to kind of know it, is pico. Pico is denoted by a uh, prefix of lowercase p, and here you would be multiplying by 10 to the negative ninth. I'm not going to write out the decimal for that one because it's quite long, and you guys kind of get the pattern from here out anyway. So let's do some practice with these prefixes. How many megabytes of data can 4.7 gigabyte DVD store? To solve this, we're going to use the train tracks that you learned in chemistry. So what do we know? We know that we have 4.7 gigabytes. I want to know how many megabytes that is. So, uh, let's see, I know that in one gigabyte I have got one mil, or sorry, billion bytes. And then I know that in one megabyte I have one million bytes. So what does that do? Well, I've got gigabytes on the top, gigabytes on the bottom, those cross off. i got bytes on the top, bytes on the bottom, those cross out. And so, if I multiply the top and I divide it by what's on the bottom, I end up getting my answer, which is 4,700 megabytes. So 4.7 gigabytes is the same thing as 4,700 megabytes. Let's do another practice. One mole of water is equivalent to 18 grams of water. 
a glass of water has a mass of 200 grams. How many moles of water is this? This sounds tough. This sounds like that mole unit from last year that everybody had such a problem with. But I assure you, it's much easier than that. We're going to use the train tracks again. The first thing you have to figure out is what do you know? Well, I know that I have a mass of 200 grams of water. Now, I also know that 18 grams of water is the same as one mole of water. So, grams of H2O, grams of H2O, those two things cancel out. And so if I multiply the top, I divide it by what's on the bottom, I find that I must have 11.11 .11 moles of water. So this is not too bad. Okay, so we're going to get away from uh, the chemistry sounding problems. And let's look at uh, some money. So we got that one US dollar is the equivalent of 0.91 euros as of uh, July of 2016. So which is worth more, one dollar or one euro? Well, to figure this out, maybe we can think about buying something. Let's say we're going to buy an apple. OK? So I want to buy an apple. Now, if I was in the US, this apple, let's say, cost me $1, which is pretty accurate. If you go to Woodman's and you want to buy a Gala apple, they pretty much cost a dollar. But I have that same Gala apple, and I go over to, say, France, how much am I going to have to pay? Well, I'm going to have to pay, whoops, and this is not dollars anymore, this is euros. I'm going to have to pay 0.91 euros. So I'm paying less than one if I'm going to pay for that apple in France than if I'm going to pay for it in the U.S. So if I have to pay one dollar in the U.S. and less than one in France, it must mean that the euro is worth more because I don't have to use as many. So we'll say the euro is worth more. Because you don't have to use as many to buy something. Now, when you guys are here in physics class and you get a question like this, which is worth more, one dollar or one euro, be sure that you explain why you answer that. So it's not sufficient just to say the euro is worth more. I want you to say why you know that. Second part of this problem, how many dollars is one euro? So that sounds to me like a dimensional analysis problem. I have one euro. Well, I know that there are 0.91 euros in one dollar. So I've got euros on the top, I've got euros on the bottom, those cross out. Once I multiply the top and divide it by the bottom, then I should get my answer. And I, ooh, I don't actually don't have it written on my paper, so let's do it right now. All right, so we've got one times one is one. That's the top, we're gonna divide it by the bottom, which is point, oops, one divided by point nine one. Here we go. One point, and we're going to round this up to a dollar ten. The one euro is equivalent to one dollar and ten cents. Let's flip the page. All right, last thing we're going to do here, we're going to identify the shape of some graphs, and we're going to say what modification you would make in order to make it a straight line. Now, this uh, seems a little bit different than what we were doing before, but this is going to lead us into what we're going to do every time we do a lab this year. Every time we do a lab, we're always going to take some data, we're going to end up graphing it, and we're going to get different shapes. We might get a straight line, we might get kind of an upward-facing curve, we might get a sideways-facing curve, 
and we might get something that doesn't cross the x or the y axis at all. And we need to make all of these into straight lines. So let's start here with this one. Right here, we've got a straight line. It starts at 0, 0. We would call this a direct proportion. And if we wanted to make this into a straight line, well, we don't have to do anything. It already is a straight line. So there's no modification here. Let's go to this next one to the right, this upward facing curve. You hopefully recognize this from uh, math class. This is what it looks like when you do something like y equals x squared. So we're going to call that an x squared relationship. And if we wanted to try to make this uh, curve into a straight line, what we're going to do is we're going to plot a graph where instead of plotting just y and x on that graph, we're going to plot a graph where y is on the x-axis, but x squared is going to be on the, uh, sorry, y is on the y-axis and x squared is on the x-axis. So your numbers on your, x on your x are going to be different than they were originally. Uh, if we go down to the lower left-hand corner, this is that sideways facing curve. Maybe you guys have seen this. Maybe you haven't in math class. Uh, but this is a y-squared relationship. So if we want to make this into a straight line, we're going to have to plot a graph and again, just like the last one, we're not just going to plot y on the y and x on the x. We're going to square all of our original y values, put that on the y-axis, but keep those x values the same. And then lastly, uh, the lower right-hand corner, here we have uh, a graph that does not touch the y or the x-axis. So we would say that y and x are asymptotes of this graph. And that is a clear indication to us that this is an inverse relationship. So in an inverse relationship, in order to make that a straight line, we are again going to create a new graph. And we are going to do a graph of y on the y-axis and the inverse of x on the x-axis. Again, it might seem a little confusing why we are doing this, but after you guys do your first lab, it's going to be made abundantly clear. All right, thanks very much. Have a good one.